Hmm? Do you want some water? Yeah. What do you prefer? Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here with us today. My name is Maria Cristina Didero. I'm an independent design curator. And I was asked by Salone del Mobile to put together a, a talk about sustainability. So sustainability is one of our most important and crucial issues today, along with a couple of other few. And I thought that uh, I would like to invite these uh, three profiles in order to talk of what could be sustainable today. So sustainability, it's a concept that could be also, I mean, it can have like a broader sense. It's not just about using a bike instead of a car. It's about uh, having a certain perspective of mind in order to understand that we all are on the same boat, and that's not my line, but that we all have to do something. So sustainability is not using so much plastic and this, this and that, saving, recycling, but also being respectful towards people. So um, I was very happy to, to invite Dan Rosengarden, designer, be, mm, designer, artist, I, don't, I never know how. No, Dan Rosengarden, <laughs> he is a master in order to translate technology into poetry and thinking about our planet. We have Victoria Seidel. Victoria Seidel just founded the uh, Global um, Climate um, Gallery. Cli I'm sorry. Gallery Climate Coalition. Gallery Climate Coalition. It's an, it's an organization that is concerned about linking together a network of gallery in order to share cost, to to um, to share um, uh, transport and planes in order to. To, to save and, and not to spend money again in things that we need for our event that we cannot, of course, avoid, but that know that can be shared by uh, more people. And then we have Eva Felcom. I'm very happy to have Eva because, as I said, sustainability is also respecting other people, trying to help, which is very much... Uh, what she does, connecting uh, a network of uh, very high professional people to charity, NGO, and so on. So as you see, it's very, very three different kinds of, of take on this subject. And I'm very happy to give the word to, to Dan to start yeah, with so your right. work. Okay. Thank you Super. very much. Thank you. Thank you. You want to sit over there so you can see the screen? Ah, okay. okay. Yeah, yes. Thanks for the <laughs> intro. If we cannot imagine um, that better future, that sustainable future you addressed, we can also not create it, right? So we have to wonder, to think, to dream, and only then we can engineer, construct, and make it a reality. Um, this is my home, the Netherlands, which is exactly doing that. Uh, most of it, it is be below sea level. So without technology, without design, we would literally drown, right? But because of these kind of beauties, a 32 kilometer dam, um, we sort of survive. So we use design, we use technology to create our own home. But sometimes even the Dutch, they forget, right? And that's why we created Waterlicht that you see here uh, for the Dutch government to create water awareness. A combination of LEDs and lenses which shows how high water level would be if we stop, right? If we don't invest in new ideas, if we take life for granted, so it shows the rising sea level, eh, the 2.5 meters, uh, which is expected before the year 2100, seems far away, but it's quite nearby, to sort of make it more into an experience. Short movie. Walking around the building here is kind of surreal, like being underwater, but you're not. I had problems to breathe, so it's it's absolutely crazy. Kind of like drowning, but in a nice way. <laughs> on one hand, I had a feeling of fear, and on the other side, it's just like being part of an illusion, being part of a real Fata Morgana. It's like a combination of destruction and possibilities at the same time. tells me about climate change, 
tells me about what we're doing with the earth, so we should be careful. If people see this, they want to change something about it. So I'm not very scared when I look at it. I think it gives me more hope. So somehow people don't change because of numbers, right? <laughs> it's really weird when we talk about the future. Numbers don't help us to, uh, to accept or to create change. But the moment you introduce beauty eh, or design and you make it into an experience, people open up. This was a 700 year old castle uh, at the risk of being flood actually, World UNESCO heritage. And to create awareness of that, we just flooded it. it created this sort of, yeah, what are we looking at, right? <laughs> this sort of weird little dreamscape. Um, thousands of people came. It's always free entrance, eh? so no, no ticket needed. Some were a bit scared, eh? like, is this our future world? Others were more mesmerized. You look, see all these people there? It's crazy. And so I think somehow we're not using beauty as a strategy to help people to accept change, right? We talk about money, we talk about technology, we talk about politics, but we don't use beauty as a strategy to help people to accept change. And so I think that's the power of these installations, that people open up, they come together. Um, yeah, let's, let's be curious about our future, not, not scared. This is the, the team working, uh, project managers, designers, engineers, some random person who wanted to be on the photo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. In that way, I think that's the, the, the true beauty to create this sort of collective experience that people can just plug in and wonder. Or here, this is a 20,000 square meter field of leak. I was asked by the Rabo Bank, one of the largest banks in the world, to think about the future of food, future of agriculture. And we found this beautiful place of leak and started to think with the farmers, with the light experts, with the bankers, and working on light recipes. Light not just as beauty, but as an activator. So this is 10 months later. The red and the blue helps the crops uh, to grow uh, better. Eh? When the sun goes down, the light of grow picks it up. But the UV light, which is inside of it is as well, activates the defense system of the crops and therefore can help to reduce pesticide. And I'm a city boy, right? So I don't know the difference between uh, a field of leek or a field of carrots, right? In the beginning. Okay, now I know, but you know what I mean. So we don't really see the places that feed us. We don't really understand them. We hardly notice them. And that sort of hurdles and struggles the, the innovation that is needed. So grow in that way is sort of an homage uh, to the places that feed us, uh, an experience and at the same time a, a platform for science. I'll show you a short movie about it. So it was cold and rainy and Safety. early Empty. and really cold. Uninhabited. It's the farmer, Dennis. We often dream about creating a better future. Yet we hardly notice the fields that feed us. How can we show the beauty of agriculture? How can we make the farmer the hero? And how can light help crops to grow more sustainably? Grow is actually inspired by scientific research. It shows specific light recipes can enhance plant growth and reduce the use of pesticide up to 50%. So when the sun goes down, the light of grow continues.
step by step, learning, improving, growing. And it was sort of so cool to sort of be in that field eh? where light is an activator, an enabler, not just decoration. And in the morning we came and we started to install eh? it was cold and rainy. And the farmer was like, what are these city boys and girls doing in my field? You know, it was a bit like, but then in the evening, um, we started to work on it with the scientists eh? McCree curve, which helps to define the wife uh, wavelength to enable the crops to grow better. And he couldn't stop looking at his own crops, right? So suddenly my world of, of light and innovation and his world of food production uh, came together. And I think when we talk about the future and a sustainable future, maybe that's what it is about. Eh? Don't think in linear sector, corner, boxes thinking. You know, but a farmer and an artist working together. Agriculture and experience. You know, why not? Maybe in this crossover thinking is the acceleration uh, that we all crave for. This is now traveling to 40 other countries, each country with its own light recipe, crops in uh, rice in China or wheat in America, soya in Australia. Um, a work of art and at the same time a platform for, for, for science. Yeah. Last one. Um, so I became really obsessed with this notion of, of, of experiences. Eh? Again, I think the power of an experience is that you're willing to change, right? It can be negative, but it can also be positive. And maybe that's what's needed in the world of today. Because pure rational thinking somehow blocks us. So two years ago, we were asked by the city of Bilbao to rethink the power of celebration, eh? coming together as a community. And we knew that traditional firework is cool, but quite polluting as well, right? So if you have traditional fireworks with big bangs, all the dogs go crazy. Eh? Increase of air pollution 10 times. So basically I'm saying, Happy New Year, here's a cloud of toxic air, right? They're like, mm, maybe we want to... We want to change that a little bit, eh? Yeah, may maybe not. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. So we keep the tradition, but we modernize it, right? And I think that's that's you can apply that to many themes. So this is last week actually in Bilbao in the public park, Spark. And what you're seeing here are not ugly drones, balloons, or confetti, but biodegradable bubbles uh, and a smart way of of light reflection, light absorbing, creating the first organic fireworks um, in the city of Bilbao. Short movie. Can we put the sound up a bit? How can we celebrate in a sustainable way? Yeah, so it starts with asking questions. Here they come, How little, can we little feel aliens. With nature. How can we spark a sense of wonder, inspired by nature, we bring organic lights into the city. So the wind makes that it's always changing. Eh? Basically, you're showing the, 
the, the, the thermodynamics f from nature. Reflection in the in the water. We're planning on putting little seeds in them. Yeah, so when you do this three months later, you get flowers. That's sort of cool. Not yet, but working on it. That's cool. Spark. Reflect together. Celebrate as one. And so, again, we take... Yeah, please. Sorry, what about? What about the birds? Oh, it's a cloud of 40 by 50 meters. Yeah, so, so the birds... I, uh, sorry? They can decide it's food. Yeah, that's why we didn't put the seeds in yet. One more reason to not do the seeds. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Good question. And, but it was so cool to sort of... Um, There's another question. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, let's do the question. Hit me. Just, uh, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, I was curious about the material that you use for the yeah. bubbles. So it's like a biodegradable bubble and the light is reflected and absorbed in a smart way. So there's nothing sort of almost physically in it. Hmm? No, 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 no liquid. No, it's like a, it's like 40 times thinner than your hair. Huh? That's why it flows. And what you're seeing in the movie is that's why it's so fun because sometimes it does this and this and this so it has its own be sometimes we're looking at it like why is it doing that right so on one hand you want control yeah, i'm a designer i want control and control but the other hand is also to let go and be out of control or in co-control and let nature do its thing um, and it was so cool to sort of it's it's free nights open so we didn't know if anybody would like it right <laughs> we don't know maybe they hated it but people came with their friends and their, their children and they stayed for more than an hour, which was surprising. So it just shows that, that we can take the tradition of celebration and modernize it and show yeah, that, that alternatives can be, can be real and can be good for, for human. And also fun, maybe, maybe to conclude, my students say our future is frozen yeah, when you talk about the sustainable world. So sustainability is about doing less. We can't buy a hammer anymore. Meat is not really done. You know, fly. And it's it sort of sucks, right? This future, it's not fun, right? Yeah, and, and that really resonated with me two years ago when they said that. And so I think, yeah, they're sort of right, right? This next generation is inheriting all the challenges. We're not giving them the toolkit to fix it. Yeah? And we're just banning everything. And so maybe that sort of is the drive behind these kind of projects to bring back nature uh, and to bring back the notion of, of fun and experience. And maybe last one. Um, 500 years ago, we as human beings thought we were the center of the universe, right? Right? We're like, okay, we are the center and everything turns around. It's sun, earth, planet, like, like everything tur turns around the, 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 the earth. And then three really annoying smart guys came, Galileo, Copernicus and Kepler. And he said, no, 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 no. Actually, this, they were turning around the sun, which is 148 million kilometers away from us. And people really didn't like that. Now we know that's true, right? But we still call it sunset, sunrise. <laughs> so we still haven't really changed our perception. Maybe we have to change our perception again. Yeah? In, we cannot control nature, COVID, climate change, uh, viruses, air pollution. So we have to reshift our, our balance, reshift our perspective. And I hope this kind of project and design helps in changing that perspective. Last one. Um, design is about adding. Adding sometimes is not good, eh? stuff, material, energy. So one night I realized we have this amazing light spectacle already in our sky. Right? The stars, thank you. But we don't see it because of light pollution. So what if for one night we just switch all the lights off, all the city lights? Um, so that's the project Seeing Stars. This is a uh, normal night. This is night, real photo, eh? Like, not Photoshop, real photo, where we convinced mayors, citizens, entrepreneurs to switch off all the lights, lights off, stars on, and bring back nature into the city. The city of Leiden, September 25th this year, will do it as well, a 10 times bigger city, as part of the European Year of Science. Here, 
we adapt our way of living. We, 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 we switch our lights off. We close the curtains to bring back the light of the stars. I didn't design the stars, right? They've been, no, I didn't. I've been there for millions of years. So here I remove, here I reveal. And maybe that kind of thinking um, is the way to go. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Dan. Thanks a lot. I particularly liked when, like when you said that you don't use light as a decoration, but when you use light, it's really for different layers, different purposes. Yes. Great. So, Victoria, Gallery Climate Coalition. Sorry, I pronounced it wrongly. So, would you like to to inform our audience what is your sure. activity and why you got into action? Great. Um, hello, buongiorno, and thank you so much, Maria Cristina, for inviting me to speak Thanks today. For being here. Um, I'm Victoria Siddle. I'm a non-executive director of Freeze, where I ran art fairs for many, many years. So I feel very at home in Salone de Mobile. Um, and I'm also a co-founder and a trustee of Gallery Climate Coalition, which is an international charity and membership organization that provides gu guidelines and goals around environmental sustainability for the art world, and launched 18 months ago. Um, I'm going to touch on three areas briefly. The first is the power of art and ideas to impact change, very much what Dan has been talking about already. Um, then I'm going to talk about the practical reality of lowering our carbon footprint. Obviously, this is where the real challenge lies, as we know, especially for the art world and certain other industries. Um, and that's very much where Gallery Climate Coalition comes in. And then I just wanted to touch briefly as well on what we can do to support the organizations outside of the art world, outside of the design world, who are doing the most to really save the planet, who are having the most effective impact right now. Um, so firstly, artists play a really vital role in impacting the way we see the world, the way we think. They can influence, they can inspire, and they can bring about change. Um, we saw this in the 80s in New York, the AIDS crisis. Artists were really instrumental in making work that changed the way that people perceived what was going on and ultimately brought about political change as well. We've seen this more recently with artists working, um, making work specifically around environmental issues. Uh, there's one example on the screen now. This is a project by Olafur Eliasson. He placed um, icebergs as he called them, in major cities, uh, London outside Tate Modern, this was in Paris, um, and of course slowly they melted over a number of days. Um, the artist Fiona Banner, British Turner Prize winning artist, placed an enormous lump of granite rock outside the home office um, in collaboration with Greenpeace to protest the, the sort of land that was supposed to be being protected and wasn't. Um, we did a Gallery Climate Coalition conference in London last November, and the British Nigerian poet, uh, Ben Okri, he spoke at the end of it, and he said, you consider yourself a small part of a bigger problem, but you're actually a really part, important part of it because you deal with vision and how people see and how they clarify their perception of the world. Art is potentially extremely powerful regarding climate change and should be a leader in this area. So secondly, how do we go about this? How does an industry and a community become more environmentally sustainable? I need a clicker. <laughs> Which one is it? Uh, the big green one. Great. Thank you. Um, so this was the question that a group of people were asking in early 2020, made up of gallery owners, uh, writers, art fair directors, that was me. Um, we came together and started talking about the fact that we and everybody we knew really cared about this issue and wanted to make a change. But that, that as a group of individuals and small businesses, it was very difficult to do so in isolation. And that we needed to come together as a coalition to give ourselves you know, organizational power Power and also lobbying power. And this is how GCC was formed. Obviously, the pandemic was awful in every possible way, except that it did afford us the opportunity to put real time and energy into the formation of this new organization and charity. And we met weekly for the first year throughout 2020. And in October 2020, GCC was born. 
and announced. It's a membership organization um, that essentially is free to join and provides resources that are free for galleries to use. The aims of GCC are simple. There are two goals. The first is 50% uh, reduction in carbon emissions across the sector by 2030. This is in line with the Paris Agreement, so it's not something we just made up as the art world, but we're really trying to kind of get in line with the global goals. And the second is zero waste. Um, with any big art event, exhibition, there is an enormous amount of waste that's generated, and um, that's something that we're doing a huge amount of research into helping to solve. Um, this is a breakdown of our membership now. I mentioned we announced in October 2020, so about 18 months ago. We now have 800 members worldwide. And all 800 members, predominantly galleries, have signed up to these goals. So potentially, as a coalition, we can make an enormous change to our industry. We have, as you can see, over 300 commercial galleries. GCC was originally founded by and for commercial galleries, but actually what we found is that it's been adopted by the whole sector. We have over 120 institutions and nonprofits who are members. We have over 100 individual artists and collectives, um, businesses, individuals. The idea of it really is to enable the entire sector at every level to get involved and make these changes. It's also something that's gone way beyond London, where it was originally founded. Um, we have a volunteer group working in London, of course, and a team there, but we also have one in Berlin. Um, after that came Los Angeles. And then we were very excited to announce most recently our Italy group, um, which combines uh, galleries and institutions and artists from Milan, Naples, and Rome. And then you can see there we're working on Sao Paulo, Japan, Brussels, Barcelona, New York, Mexico City, really trying to take over the world with this one. The key thing we found is that we can talk as much as we want about this, but if we don't provide the resources, like practical tools and resources to make these changes, then of course there's no way that it can happen. Um, so we provided resources that have been developed by volunteer teams working with environmental experts from outside the art world in areas such as shipping and insurance, printing and publishing, conservation, travel, registrar, registrars, circularity, waste and recycling, packaging and materials, and we have more of these in the pipeline. However, the biggest tool, the most important thing that we realized from the beginning that we needed to produce and share was a carbon calculator that was tailored to the art world and that was really easy to use. So this is something we built with ArtLogic um, and launched with our website in October 2020 and have since encouraged galleries, artist studios, institutions to use the calculator. It's free to use, it's really simple to calculate their annual carbon emissions. It's also quite fun to play with because you can just go on and see what the carbon emissions are if you're taking a return flight to LA in business class. You can check to see the comparative emissions between taking the train to London or flying to London. Um, so it's quite a useful comparison to, uh, tool as well. So I'd encourage you to have a play with it. It's quite fun actually. Um, but since then we've had a number of audits that have been submitted to us by galleries and institutions and they make really interesting reading because it really focuses the mind. This is from a sort of medium-sized um, uh, contemporary art gallery in London called Modern Art Gallery. And um, it essentially breaks down into just over 50% travel and shipping not far after that. And then building energy, small percentage, I think less than 10%, and then other things. So it really shows how for a, for, for a commercial art gallery, shipping and travel are the two big areas. So if you want to make a change, that's really where you have to focus. And it helps to see this, because if you can't see where your emissions are coming from, if you can't measure, you can't reduce. This is um, a very big international gallery, Hauser & Wirth, who have spaces in uh, New York, Los Angeles, London, Zurich, Hong Kong. They're opening more galleries all the time. So it, but it's interesting to see that it breaks down 
in a fairly similar way. It's just over 50% shipping and then travel, small amount of building energy, and then other bits and pieces. Um, so this was super helpful for us to see as GCC because it meant we knew where to focus. It's all about shipping. And actually, we just launched a sustainable shipping campaign last week. If you're interested, it's all there on the website um, to really try to support the industry in this area. I mentioned that we've also had nonprofits and institutions use this tool. And it's interesting to see the difference for a museum. So this is Nottingham Contemporary, which is um, uh, a museum, medium-sized museum in the United Kingdom. They use the online carbon calculator provided by GCC to do this audit. And you will see that nearly 90% of their emissions come from their building energy. So it's a really different picture than it is for commercial galleries. So again, interesting lesson for GCC in how we approach galleries, museums, artist studios in different ways and provide different kind of goals and resources for each of them. So the third point I mentioned was how, like what else, this is the next question we started asking ourselves, is what more can the art world do to support those outside of the art world who are really making the biggest difference in terms of environment and sustainability? And this is how we came across Client Earth. So Client Earth are an environmental law firm who essentially take the earth as their client. So they sue governments, hold them to account, force them to close down coal-fired power stations. They do extraordinary work all over the world, really targeting where the biggest emissions are coming from. So we thought, how can we support them in the work that they do? And realize that the art world is very good at raising money and getting attention. So we thought, this is two great goals for, you know, for a charity like this. Um, so we went to some of the leading artists in the world. This is a painting by Cecily Brown um, that she donated to an auction series to raise money for Clients Earth. This started in October last year. It's still running. This was the first painting we sold. Um, it went for £2 million, uh, all of which went to Client Earth. And we then had a painting by Rashi Johnson that sold in New York, Zinan Zing in Hong Kong. We're trying to sell the works in their country of origin so that we don't have to ship them across the world for the auction. Um, we had an Anthony Gormley sculpture in London in March, and there's an amazing painting by Beatriz Miliazes, which is coming up for sale in June. So, so far we've raised about $6 million for Client Earth, and also really raised awareness of what they're doing within the art world, and presented organizations like this as an alternative to the traditional notion of offsetting, we're suggesting instead the idea of strategic climate funds where money is given to organizations like this who are making a really big sweeping difference now. An example of something they did was to essentially force the Polish government to close down a huge coal-fired power station in Poland. And the annual carbon emissions of that power station were four times the carbon emissions of Europe's biggest airline gone overnight. So they're really making huge sweeping changes that are, are nowhere close, you know, sort of so far from anything we can really conceive within our own industry. Um, so finally, this is a, a QR code in case you haven't found the Gallery Climate Coalition website yet. Um, but what I wanted to say is that I, I participated in a panel discussion about this recently and about this topic and the last question that came up was, do you have hope? And interestingly, all of the panelists answered a resounding that yes. That was my question at the end. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, it's an important one. And I noticed, Dan, in one of the videos you showed, one of the participa participants said that what she was seeing made her feel scared, but it also gave her hope. And it is an incredibly important part of this conversation. It's why we're all sitting here having this conversation. If we didn't, we wouldn't be having the conversation. We wouldn't be doing the work. We wouldn't be raising the money. Um, and another thing I have to say that's given me hope is just to see the momentum around this issue, the amount of conversation that's now happening about it, the fact that we're, you know, every, every sort of, you know, talks program has a panel about sustainability, artists are engaged, young people are engaged. Um, there's definitely a way forward with this that is going to make for a better world in the future. So thank you very much for being here and for listening. Thank you, Victoria. 
Thanks a lot. Eva, Eva Felkam, all in all. Great, thank you. Hi, great to be here. And um, yeah, it's inspiring to hear about what creative projects can do to inspire people and what a whole industry can do to take responsibility for the climate. I'm here today to talk to you about what you can do to help people and the planet. Um, my name is Eva Feldkamp. I'm a designer and a strategist, and I'm the founder and director of All in All, uh, which is a social enterprise that works with creatives to connect them to charities for purposeful projects. Um, I have, like many of you, I'm sure, attended Salone for the past 15 years, and I've walked down or up and down these halls, um, looking at all the new materials, all the new furniture, specifying them for projects. And I always found it really inspiring, but also overwhelming and exhausting at times. And I kept asking myself when so many creative minds and a powerful industry are in a building or several buildings like this, where are the questions about what we can do to use our skills right now to really make a difference in the world? So I kept asking this and um, didn't really find an answer, so I'll show you <laughs> what I did with that. Um, my background is in product and interior design. I studied in Eindhoven and Berlin and I worked with Philippe Malouin and Elsa Crawford and then I led the interior design team at Tom Dixon. And while I was working in all these amazing studios on global projects, um, I felt like I was spending my time in a very thin layer of society. So to balance that, I started to volunteer a lot in my private time. And I would meet a young person once a week to develop a long-term friendship. Um, I'm still now calling an old person that's lonely for five years, I think, once a week. And I volunteer at a food bank. And so I was spending my time in these two separate worlds in a way. So there was the professional world in, in all these amazing studios and then the private time in the non-profit world. And I realized how much these two could benefit from one another. So a very simple example is the food bank. If only they would have better labeling, better boxes, better furniture, everything could just be much more efficient for them. Um, it could be much more inviting to all the users of the food bank. And it could become a system that you can roll out to actually make it work much better. And that's not happening right now. So all these organizations are doing this in isolation very often. Um, so I really think that design can help here and can be a really powerful tool to not only make things look more beautiful, but work much better. And I think it's a win-win situation. So it's not only the designers helping the nonprofits, but also the nonprofits giving more purpose to the designers and to manufacturers and buyers or developers to find new markets that they haven't worked with yet and that could really help them to understand how they can work better. So realizing how much these worlds could help each other, I quit my job at Tom Dixon uh, to find out how I could make that work, how I can help to actually make this a functioning thing. And I spoke to as many charities, nonprofits, and public sector bodies as I could to understand what they really need and find out how they work. So I realized they need a connector and a communicator and someone that they can really trust to put them in touch with the right people. And to do that, I launched All in All. Um, and our goal is to easily, efficiently, and effectively connect these charities to the creatives. And I recently um, had the privilege to be part of Alice Rothons and Paula Antonelli's design emergency program, who said that uh, what All in All does is redesigning design practice, which is an interesting way of looking at it. We essentially work with charities, nonprofits, and the public sector. And our clients are anything from really small organizations to really large scale NGOs. Most of them have no idea what design could do for them, so they think design is furniture and luxury, and they get lost talking about it. So we all know that design is much more than furniture, and that it could do much more to them if only they knew what it would be. Um, I think one interesting example there is plastic straws. So we all know how quickly plastic straws 
get eliminated from the market. And that's largely due to amazing image campaigns, great taglines. And it's interesting because plastic straws are so non-essential to the climate crisis, but it's one thing where the creative industry really helped to make it work and make a big change. So if only we find the right reasons and the right goals, we can really make a difference. So how we really work is we work with three key groups of people. We work with creatives and we understand what they are really good at and what they can give. We work with charities and nonprofits and we understand what they really need. So we develop briefs together with them. And then we connect with funders who really believe in significant impact and who want to support these projects. And in all this, all in all acts as a nexus. So we communicate between all the different parties and make sure it's the right connections and the right parties that are involved. And we really don't believe that we are saving the world with our skills, but we believe that we are doing our part and do what we can and what we learned um, to help the world really. And I think we as an industry can learn a lot from those environments. So one really simple example is when I speak to charities, we start a conversation and we tell each other who we are, what we do. But the next thing is we talk about what we need. So the next question literally is, how can I help you? What are you working on? What do you need? And we do that to one another. And the third thing is, here's my answer. I'll connect you to these people and I'll make this happen for you and with you. So I think that's a big, a big thing we can implement much more in our projects. Right now, all in all is a network of 60 global creatives. We work with graphic designers, photographers, writers, strategists, and web developers on communication projects. And we work with architects, interior designers, and product designers on spatial projects. And like Maria Cristina said earlier, all of them are highly qualified. <laughs> and all of them really care about people and the planet. And that's two really essential bits to be a collaborator and to work with us. Um, they are paid typical market rates and when they sign up they can decide to give a discount or on specific projects they can decide to volunteer. But it's impressive to see how much funding you can get within these projects if only you know the right people and you do the right applications. Um, we work with studios of all sizes so our collaborators are sometimes individuals, freelancers, but also large-scale um, design studios. And we work with companies that want to give back or with companies that have to give back and don't know how to do that. And um, how we make sure we all work um, on the same kind of projects and on the same goals is we have a code of conduct, so a shared set of values, uh, which we all abide to. And we've completed 10 projects so far and we have 25 in the pipeline. Um, and those projects are really anything from websites to office spaces to community hubs, posters, uh, workshops or exhibitions. So one example of a project is the Future Libraries Initiative, which is a project in Peterborough. Um, there's a social enterprise called Civic and they wanted to test this space as a pilot for a larger project they're working on in the UK to revolutionize the library system. So they're working on seven projects to roll out in the UK and then internationally to make libraries more accessible to people who don't currently use them and don't have access to them. So we had a site visit and an empty retail unit in Peterborough. And the brief was within three weeks to make this space much more inviting and a vibrant community hub that would pull people in from the street. They had hardly any budget and um, so yeah, we went back and assembled a team of eight different collaborators, so architects, interior designers, product designers. They also needed graphics and a website, so we did that too. Um, and Quadrat sponsored 300 meters of curtain fabric, La Russi sponsored rugs. So together with all these combined forces, we made it work within three weeks to deliver this community hub and they now have many more visitors than they ever had before so it really worked for them to to get it done because we connected the right people. Um, a very different type of project 
is a poster campaign that we worked on for a local cooperative in East London. So they had hoarding going up in front of a building site and they wanted to attach posters to it. And I had no idea how big these posters could be, what size the images could have, how the text could fit. And we had a one hour call with them and did a really quick PDF. And from that, they could then figure out what to put onto these posters. So again, it's something that's really basic and, and we wouldn't even consider as something you need to ask someone for. But for them, it was a huge support and it's an example of us volunteering for an hour and helping someone who then for weeks kept telling us how helpful it was and, and it really changed the experience of their community because they had these posters going up and they could show local art on it. We also work on a lot of charity offices at the moment, so that's quite interesting. We collaborate closely with effective altruism charities. And there are a lot of new organizations that popped up during the pandemic that didn't have workspaces and now need new collaborative spaces that need to function really differently to the previous office. So they need to be really flexible, really collaborative. And um, it's interesting because we are working with them on how can an organization scale once you moved in and how can you move to another location, how can you change your whole business model and keep the same design or have a design that can adapt to that. So yeah, it's really early days for all in all. Um, we started one and a half years ago and I'm amazed and humbled by the fact how quickly it grew to this vibrant community. Um, and we realized that the opportunities are enormous. So yeah, there's a huge appetite for creatives wanting to work on these kinds of projects. Um, there are lots of charities who, who really need this and who, when we talk to them, are really inspired and engaged in setting up these projects with us. And there's a lot of funding we can access. Um, so it's really it's a whole other field to get into. Um, so yeah, we work on global projects already now. Um, but what we want to build is a system that can connect people much better and much faster. Uh, so thanks to technology, which we all know from the pandemic again, video calls made it all much easier for all in all to, to build and to grow because people are used to this now. People find it completely normal to work with one another collaboratively across countries and time zones. But also clients are much more open to this, um, to just set up remote teams with one another. So yeah, we are building a system um, to scale this up and to, to make projects much more autonomous. So how you can help us, and you really can, <laughs> is to spread the word. Um, we really want to grow the all in all network, so we want more creatives to sign up. We also want people to come to All in All with any opportunities, however large or small, for projects. And we need support, and that can take any form. So it can be funding, partnerships, relationships, or advice. And if you are willing to share with us, we'll make sure to share with you whatever we know. Um, and I realized that transparency and openness is key to make a difference in these kinds of projects. Um, so I thought I'd give you my number and you can get in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thanks, Eva. Thank you very much. So as you have seen, uh, three different profiles, three different experiences, but you know, the goal, it's, the goal is to take care about us. So technology, creativity, beauty come together to improve uh, our future, sharing, sharing it's important to come together and to look for those who surround us to help. It's another way to be responsible, just like putting the plastic bottle in the right place. Do you have any question for our speakers? Please. Okay. Ciao. Uh, I have many questions though, first for you, for, for, sorry, uh, I have many questions, first <laughs> for you, uh, how is the, the size of your um, equipe 
uh, the how many people work with you in any project and how long uh, you prepare you plan the project until it uh, appears a show to anyone sure. yeah that's that's a very practical question i can answer that sure um uh, so you have a, you have a core team, eh? 10, 12, 20 people, designers, engineers, project managers. But each project you, you work with the experts, right? So with the farmers or with firework experts or with uh, astro astronomy people, eh? depending on the, on the topic. 80%, um, no, 70% what we do is commissioned. Eh? So like a mayor or a museum or a curator comes and says, can you? Eh? But 20, 40% is we initiate it ourselves. So seeing stars is a crazy idea. I'm like, oh, this. so I just called the head of tourism board in the Netherlands. I said, I need a mayor who wants to switch off all the lights. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I called him. I said, I have an idea. He's like, oh, boy. There we go again. <laughs> I need a mayor who wants to switch off all the lights. Silence. Mm -hmm. Silence. Eh? Like six second silence. Like, I hate those moments, but six second silence. He's like, why? To see the stars. He's like, I'll call you back tomorrow. Yeah. And so he connected. So again, the network and people sort of willing to understand your idea. So sometimes people say, I, 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 I have an idea. And I, no, you don't. Yeah? You don't own an idea. You surrender to an idea. And you feel it with love, time, money, and energy. Um, you want to be surrounded by people who in a certain way are smarter than you, right? So that, because then it grows. So for sure, I begin it and I end it like a curator. But in, bet in between, it's not, um, how do you say, it's, you're not bowling, but you're ping-ponging. Yeah? There are a lot of iterations. Uh, and you do that with 10, 12 projects at the same time. So they always feed each other, right? So the, the testing of the grow of the light recipes, which needed to have the right intensity, so the light had to move, which created the firefly waves. I'm like, okay, but what if we do that up in the air? That initiated spark, right? So it's also interesting how the project and the knowledge and the science sort of feeds each other. Um, so yeah, so that, that's, that's sort of it, yeah. But basically you put some smart people in a room, pizza hotline on the door, and you say, nobody leaves until we have a proposal. Yeah. Not, not opinion, but proposal. Yeah, so that's how it sort of works. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. I don't know how it works for you, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Similar? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I have a question for Dan. How affordability plays... Sorry. Hi, I have a question for Dan. How affordability plays a role in sustainability, like uh, in a developing countries? How do you see affordability plays in yeah. a, a role as a wow. sustainable nice. environment? Nice. So that's 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 your one million question right there, because it's really unfortunate we live in a world where to pollute is for free, right? That's sort of not fair, because when you ask about what's the price of clean air, eh? or or it's, it's, it becomes immediately poetic but not tangible. So we all agree on that sustainability is clean air, clean water, clean space, um, but we don't know how to value it within the economic system, right? So like a grow where you say light recipes, and I can never compete with a liter of pesticide because it's like super cheap. Yeah, it doesn't include the damage, etc. So in 25 years, we'll have an all-inclusive economy eh, where the t-shirt you buy or the airplane or the, is included in the price of the product. Until that time, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I use beauty, beauty as a strategy, right? I, I try to make something that people, they don't really understand it, but they want it, right? And they embrace it. They want to be a part of it. They want to invest in it. They want to make it grow, right? Um, and so that helps to, to make these projects scalable and realizable. But you're right. When you go to certain countries, which are really, you know, talking about the, 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 the euros and the, and the cents, um, you really need pe people with leadership and long-term vision to make it happen. Uh, and like fashion, like fashion hey, you have your haute couture, your Iris van Herp, uh, 60,000 euro dress on the, on the catwalk in Paris. The knowledge which is built up there dwindles down to the, to the pret-a-porter of your, of your 12 euro t-shirt. But these are long-term processes, and uh, you're right. These are day-to-day -day challenges I'm also facing. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question to Victoria. Um, I was wondering if in your carbon calculator... Can you, sorry, can you speak a little closer? Can you hear me? A little yeah. closer, yeah. 
Yes. That's better. Thank nice. you. Thank you. Yeah, you're good. Um, regarding the carbon calculator for galleries, I was wondering, do you take into account the artworks themselves? Because not once or twice I stand in front of a sculpture and all I can think about is what a waste of material. They took really? wood and they... That's a horrible feeling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not criticism. That's a different thing. That's brutal. <laughs> but, you know, it could be a wooden sculpture dipped in resin and there's no way to separate the materials later. And I'm sorry. Mm. That's my first reaction. So do you at all take into account the artwork itself or do you start calculating from the transportation, the energy of the gallery and yeah. so on? Yeah, that's so a good, a good question. A good uh, the, the calculator is a part of what GCC does and it's specifically to calculate carbon emissions and when it comes to the fabrication of a sculpture what you're talking about is a waste of materials <laughs> but there, there are yeah absolutely you're right and I mean look there are the, the difficulty as well of calculating carbon emissions are the different scopes and and I found this at Freeze you know when we, we would do a carbon audit we could really only calculate the things that we were spending money on, which is scope one. And so when you're putting on a fair, for example, or if you're an artist making a work, you can, you know, you, you can, as the artist, you can, your scope one is the resin and the wood and the metal and how it gets to you and so on. Whereas the gallery is already into kind of scope two at that point because they're, they're not making the decision about how to make the work. Do you see what I mean? So, and the fair, for example, doesn't make a decision about how I, the Saloni doesn't make a decision about how, about we all, how we all travel here, you know? So, and they can't even calculate the emissions of how we've all traveled here because it's not even something they know. It's not information they have. So that's when we get into scope three, which is more complicated, um, but really important. You know, that, that becomes about the influence you have. As a fair, you're not making the decision about how everything is shipped here, how that, you know, that, that big screen arrived or how you arrived and, you know, you're not making, you don't have control over that, but you are influencing it and you're encouraging it. So it's similarly with an artwork. That's why with, at GCC, we're working not only with galleries, but with artists, because the artist is the one making the decision about the materials they use, the sourcing of those materials, how those materials reach their studio in the first place, what happens to them afterwards and so on. And so artists, concerns are going to be different from a gallery's concerns, which are going to be different from a collector's concerns, different from a museum's concerns. So we're trying to kind of cater to the whole industry, essentially, but, but, and acknowledge that everybody has different, you know, would you, would you in want, terms of bad art, like I said, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. But, but would you want, <laughs> Again, would you want that? A, a freezer hmm? with only sustainable okay. material art, or is that like a hard no, that you're intervening too much? I mean, I think, look, the, the art world call, no? and yeah. fairs and galleries all exist to support artists. You know, we're all there for artists. Everyone is here for, you know, design. But in the art world, it's sort of, we, we are the infrastructure that supports artists to allow them to be artists and execute their vision and make incredible work. Um, so telling artists what they can and cannot make art yeah, out of, so I have to say, like, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tricky one. I but I think there are much easier wins to be had mm. before we get to that point. You know? Good. If you yeah. look at the comparison of emissions, shipping art by air freight compared to by land and sea, yeah. it's just night and day. It's yeah. such a huge yeah. difference. Yeah. So already there, you know, like, that's an easy win, essentially. So let's, let's deal with those first and then get into the, the nitty gritty, well, yeah, the, the we detail once, of... We once calculated, if you do 10 years Salona, yeah. all the material, installation, shipment, and you would just put that in a big jar, that chunk of money and resources, it's better to just build a sort of Zeppelin, which just goes up. <laughs> and just takes it <laughs> And goes space. down, <laughs> and then, right? So, so I think, no, but seriously, like if you yeah. want to have like a long-term vision on sustainable fares, mm -hmm. you gotta make these sort of mo mobile uh, things instead of, uh, yeah. Interesting. But we're not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> And, yeah. Well, regarding this, with Stefano Boeri last year, we did mm. uh, the Super Salone yep. and everything was then uh, recycled, yep. reused. Yep. That, that was, was one of the assets of last year, Super Salone. I know we have uh, time for one more question. Yeah, you have the microphone already. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, complementing her question, I am an artist and uh, uh, my doubt is about, okay, I choose uh, a material more sustainable, like watercolor, organic watercolor, but 
till now uh, the brands don't have uh, how to say to me okay this is going to last these years or this is not going to to have any fungus or uh, you know damage the work in the time so sometimes i tend to choose a brand that is more reliable that's going to to last more time because i am afraid and i create a work and this is not going to last but how can uh, we push the the brands uh, to make more data or something like that if you know something like that to to know how to use uh, better materials um, yeah. uh, sustainable materials I mean, look, this is exactly the point i was making about strength in numbers at the beginning and how gcc came about really because the art world is made up of a group of as i said individuals and mostly small businesses you know smaller groups of people and and you don't have the power to affect that change by yourself but if you come together with a coalition of people with similar goals then you can you have lobbying power essentially so you know, no individual gallery or artist or collector was going to be able to change the way that art is shipped around the world because the shipping companies, you know, obviously have their agenda and business and so on. Um, but we found that as GCC, if we go representing 800 art organizations to the shippers and we say, this is what your clients want, then it's it's much more likely to, they'll listen, you know, and actually the, the, the discussions with them have been really productive. And, you know, one of the things that we're lobbying for, for example, is that every time a shipper sends a quote to a client, even if they've had air freight requested, that they have to put on the quote, not only the option by, of, of price of shipping by land and sea, but also the comparative carbon emissions of shipping by air and shipping by land and sea. Like the calorie count, you know, when you go to a cafe and it's like, this is X amount of calories. It might not affect your decision, but knowledge is power, you know, and then at least it's awareness. So I would say, you know, if it, like you have to, you, you, you're not as an individual going to be able to make that change. It's, it's firstly just too much work, but you come together with a group of people. There is a GCC Italy already, you know, there's no reason why an artist's group shouldn't exist that deals with exactly these kind of issues. Thank you very much. We are run out of time. Thank you, Eva Felcom. Thank you, Victoria Seidel. Thank you, Dan Rosengarde, for being here with us. That was sustainability, three different episodes. Thank you for being here. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. <laughs>